Are you one of us? 16-bit graphics, or one of them? 8-bit. Us. CD game sound. Them. Not. Hello everyone, and welcome back to Player One Start. In this video, I am continuing my review of the TurboGrafx CD. In part one, we looked at the history and the launch of this device. In this video, we're going to be taking a more in-depth look at the hardware and the tech specs of this add-on. You know, in my opinion, this add-on looks extremely cool. I really like the aesthetic of it, but it is a bit kind of clunky. Let's go ahead and take a look at it and its tech capabilities, but prepare to be a little bit underwhelmed. Now this is the console that has some assembly required. It actually takes about four different pieces to put this thing all together. If you turn the console off to the side, you will see the lock unlock button for the CD drive. This keeps it from sliding out unintentionally if you're transporting it, or if you're gaming too violently and move the console around a lot. Sliding the drive out, it doesn't actually look that impressive, it's very small and compact. In fact, it can be used as a portable CD player, but it must be plugged into power on the back in order to get sound out of it. This actually would have added extra value to the console because you could use it with hi-fi stereo equipment when you weren't using it to play games on your Turbo Graphics. Turning our attention to the bottom half of the interface unit, you actually have to turn the system upside down to unlock the console. Once you do, the system may put up a little bit of a fight to come out, depending on how long it's been in there, but it should slide out pretty easily after the initial jolt. And then looking at the interface unit itself, you can see where it interfaces with the CD-ROM drive and the back of the console. There is some hardware inside of here to split off the AV out, as well as provide power to both of the accessories. Even though both of the systems get their power from the same unit, the user is still required to turn both power switches on but there are no significant chips inside of here that are providing system-enhancing qualities. All of that can be found within the CD-ROM drive and the CD system card. Hardware-wise, the TurboGrafx CD was designed to be very compact. So when looking inside, you will see that the board is double-sided, showing different chips, resistors, and other components on one side than the other. This unit does not match the size and shape of the TurboGrafx-16, However, it was designed to match the shape and size of the original PC Engine. The PC Engine CD-ROM drive and the TurboGrafx CD drive are virtually identical, and some gamers have shown that they are compatible between the two units, although I have not been able to verify this as I only own the TurboGrafx CD and not the PC Engine CD. As the PC Engine has a different design than the TurboGrafx-16, its interface unit is designed a lot differently. Again, the motherboard may have a little bit of a different layout, but it will have the same chips that the TurboGrafx CD uses. One of the additional chips was a logic chip that was used to process digital audio from the CD. It also included an additional 64 kilobytes of DRAM for digital audio sample storage. There was also an additional 64 kilobytes of RAM inside of the interface units that would store program code or data that was loaded from the CD. The system cards actually contain more chips inside of them to help with the CD functionality as well. With the original system card having a BIOS which allowed the system to access the CD-ROM drive, as well as a BIOS update providing support for CD plus G discs, and an auto disk change mode was added in BIOS revision 2.1. The Super System card added 1.5 megabits or about 192 kilobytes of RAM, along with a new BIOS revision, and is required to run Super CD-ROM games. Yet another card was added to expand the system's capabilities even further, providing an additional 2 megabytes or 16 megabits of RAM, with the Pro Arcade card adding even more than that. In terms of the CD drive itself, it's actually a single speed or 1x CD-ROM, providing about 150 kilobytes per second read speed, but that doesn't include the time that the laser takes to adjust itself on the disk. The drive read speed is most likely the reason why there is no full screen, full motion video on the TurboGrafx-16, although there are some hardware tricks they take advantage of in order to make it look like that they can do this. Some of these hardware tricks would be very similar to how they did it on the Sega CD, as it had the same drive speed as the TurboGrafx CD. However, the CD-ROM's biggest advantage would be the fact that it has a much larger capacity than the Hue card format. 
Early Hue card games had a capacity of around 2 to 4 megabits, or 256 kilobytes to 512 kilobytes. In the later part of the system's life, that was expanded to 1 megabyte games, or 8 megabits, but even at that capacity, it would take around 700 Hue cards to reach the capacity of one CD-ROM. That higher capacity brought many advantages to games on CD-ROM. One advantage was the fact that they could provide smoother animations for sprite work, as they could store more sprites on a CD than they could on a Hue card. Of course, they would still have to conform to the RAM limitations of the system for sprites that were currently on screen, but assets could be swapped in and out on the fly by reading them from CD and putting them into RAM. The extra capacity allowed game developers to store additional graphical effects onto the CD, which would include more detailed artwork and even animated cutscenes. Perhaps one of the more obvious advantages to having an expanded capacity on CD-ROM was the fact that they could pack in additional content for a game, making levels bigger or adding more levels before the game would be shipped. And perhaps the most obvious and most used benefit was the fact that they could put full quality CD audio into games. Previously, I had stated that it was probably more worth it to collect a PC Engine than a TurboGrafx-16, as games were region-locked, and the Japanese PC Engine would have far more games than the TurboGrafx-16. However, this does not apply to the CD-ROM unit, as it is not region-locked. That means that you can play any of the games using the North American System cards to play their Japanese equivalent on your console. Even still, if you use an adapter for the arcade system card, which only came out in Japan, you can still take advantage of those games on the TurboGrafx-16. And that adapter card would also work for PC Engine Hue cards as well. So to explain a little bit more how the TurboGrafx CD actually works, it all depends on the system card that you put into it. By itself, the TurboGrafx only has about 8 kilobytes of RAM for game code. It also has an additional 64 kilobytes for the game graphics, but that would be extremely limited in what you would want to run game code for. It actually couldn't really run the game code that much at all. So instead, they added on to the RAM by including the system card. The system card is important for two purposes. Number one, it can't access the CD-ROM drive without it. It actually it provides a BIOS update to the system that has it recognized that there is a CD-ROM drive and how to run it. But the other thing is that it includes additional RAM for game code so that it could run the game off of the Hue card, and the CD would just load it to the Hue card, and it would run like normal from that. And that's like a simplistic way of saying it, but that's the gist of it. So in essence, depending on the system card that you have, you're only adding additional RAM to the system. Now there was a little bit of additional RAM inside of either the CD-ROM drive or the interface unit, haven't been able to tell which yet, but it has additional RAM for audio samples, another 64K, and that's just for being able to play CD audio while the game's running, and that's actually kind of an ingenious design. But when it all comes down to it, this interface adds more storage and more RAM. It doesn't really add anything to the capabilities of the system. So when looking for tech demos, I wasn't able to find much that really couldn't be done on stock hardware, except for those that took advantage of additional RAM. So let's go ahead and take a look at those. So from a coding standpoint, those tech demos look very impressive. I know the graphics look primitive by today's standards, but keep in mind that the performance is all being bottlenecked by that 8-bit CPU. It's the 16-bit graphics chip that makes it all look nice, or at least higher res, than any 8-bit console before it. But tech demos aside, what did actual games look like on this system? Well, let's go ahead and dive right in with the two launch titles. And just to review, the two games that were available at launch were Fighting Street and Monster Lair. 
These games only take advantage of the original system card that was released with BIOS Revision 1.0, and is backwards compatible on every single other BIOS released for the system as well. Fighting Street is the only home console port to the original Street Fighter. The original game had arcades in 1987 and was developed by Capcom. It is the first competitive fighting game produced by the company, and the first installment in the popular Street Fighter series. While it did not achieve the same worldwide popularity as its sequel, Street Fighter II, the original Street Fighter introduced some of the conventions that were made standard in later games. This version of the game features a remastered soundtrack, and as there was no six-button controller for the TurboGrafx CD at the time this version was released, the strength level of attacks are determined by how long the button is pressed. This version was published by NEC Avenue in North America and Hudson Soft in Japan and was developed by Alpha System. The cover artwork featured Mount Rushmore, which is one of the locations in the game. And while the arcade version of this game was critically well received, I could not find much information about the home port of this version, except for to say that I personally do not enjoy this game. Looking through several modern reviews, it seems that if you're a fan of this series, you will enjoy this game a lot better than those that are just casual players. For me, I find this game to be incredibly frustrating, as it seems like my controls are a bit lagged. As opposed to later games that would use six buttons, I find the two-button layout to be a tad tedious to get used to. Unfortunately, this is what sucked all the fun out for me. Back in the day, as this would have been the first game I played of its kind, I may have enjoyed it a lot better, and I would definitely recommend playing this against a second player, rather than against the computer. Thankfully, at the time of this review, if you're looking for this game, it won't break the bank to buy it and is on the more reasonable side. However, I wouldn't expect to get a lot of playtime out of it. Aside from the gameplay, the graphics and music are very well done, and I definitely appreciate the nostalgic-sounding 90s synth music that is perfectly captured with CD audio. The graphics remind me more of something in the arcade than other games on this console, so I feel like it has that going for it as well. Wonder Boy is another arcade port that made its way over to the TurboGrafx CD. The arcade game was called Wonder Boy 3 Monster Lair, and it is a side-scrolling action game. And this version of the game was ported over to the console by Hudson Soft. The game attempts to balance basic concepts found in both platformers and arcade shooters. The player is able to jump and shoot projectiles from a sword. He must also ride a flying dragon and confront a large boss throughout the second half of each round. The player's life bar steadily diminishes as time passes, health is gained through a collection of fruits and projectile weapons, some fruit when shot will expand and burst into multiple items. A lot of the concepts used in this game can be found in another one of Hudson's games, Adventure Island. Along the way, a wide variety of weapons can be picked up, and not only do these allow the player to use weapons for a limited amount of time, they also increase vitality. In the flying scenes, vitality remains static unless being hit by a passing enemy. When this game was initially released, it got a lot of mixed reception from fans and critics alike, a lot of them criticizing the fact that they moved away from the traditional elements that were in the Wonder Boy series, and as a result, many of the concepts used in this game were reverted back to the previous games in an attempt to appease fans. Sadly, that makes this game very unique in this series, as I feel like this game was done very well and I definitely enjoyed the gameplay style in this game. I think the cartoony nature of the graphics really helps it hold up on this platform, as games that tried to go for a more realistic feel look very dated today in my opinion. The sound effects are well done and match the action, and the game's soundtrack also provides that nostalgic feel of an early 90s, late 80s synthesizer soundtrack. I think this game has been better appreciated in modern times, more so than it was back in the day, and I really feel like the majority of players that pick up either of the launch titles would enjoy this game more, so I would definitely recommend this as a pickup for this console, as I feel you would get more playtime out of it. So those are the two titles that launched with the system. Fighting Street, to me, is a huge disappointment. To me, it's just not fun to play. Now, as a kid, I would have been wowed by the digital speech and the CD-quality audio coming out of it, because keeping in mind, Nintendo music was all that I was used to hearing, or at least from the NES, I still call it the, the Nintendo. But 
that would not have been enough for me to actually keep playing this game over and over again. It just incredibly frustrates me because the controls seem very delayed on purpose to make the game a bit harder. Now, I'm sure after multiple playthroughs, especially back then, I would have gotten used to it maybe, but I still don't think I would have found it very enjoyable. Now, Monster Layer, on the other hand, is the complete opposite experience. I really did like this game. The CD quality audio is something that would have kept me coming back to this game, but the gameplay is that addicting style that you really just have to repeat, memorize, and get better at the game as you go through. And I think it is a much better title than Fighting Street. At least I think it would have appealed to more gamers back then. But then, for the most part, for the next six months, those were the only games you had that were on CD. That is what your $400 plus dollar investment got you back in 1989, and I would have been sorely disappointed. Now keep in mind that you can also play Hue card games on this system, so any of the launch titles and the early titles from the TurboGrafx-16 would also have been available. But if you want to know my opinions about those, you should go back and watch my Ultimate TurboGrafx-16 review, as I don't really feel like the launch lineup was very strong there either. That said, that is going to wrap things up for this video. In the next video, we're actually going to start working through the games in chronological order, or at least as close to as I can get. Not all these are well documented when they came out, so I'm going to try to go at least in year order. Again, if you like what you see, please remember to click on that subscribe button down below, leave a like if you liked today's video, also leave a comment down below, let me know what you liked about today's video, and let me know what you like to see in the future. As always, I want to thank you all so much for watching, stay tuned because I have more content coming, and I will see you all in the next one. If you like this video and you'd like to help out with future projects on this channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Also, if you enjoy the content of this channel, please remember to click on this subscribe button. Again, I want to thank you so much for watching, I'll see you next time. Oh, 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 oh,